Live from Palo Alto, California, it's The Cube at Pier 2.0. Brought to you by the Pier 2.0 Foundations. Learn, connect, and grow. Now here are your hosts, John Furrier and Jeff Frick. Okay, welcome back. And we're here live in Silicon Valley at the Pier 2.0. 2.0 conference. I'm John Furrier, the founder of Silicon Angle. Join my co-host Jeff Frick. This is theCUBE. It's our flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the students from the noise. Our next guest is Al Bergio, CEO of IIX, a new startup that's really just got their first big round of funding, Series A from uh, NEA, a New Enterprise Associates. Uh, congratulations. Thank you. $10 Thank million you, of fat financing, as they say. Um, really validation to the concept of, of your company um, and, and the whole movement around this Peer 2.0, which is really about the next generation networks. Uh, and discussions around that. So just before we get into the whole Peer 2.0, give us a, uh, some insight about how you started at IIX, the team, the genesis, and obviously the validation with the funding, obviously the market opportunity, the business mm -hmm. opportunity. So you know, where did it come from? How did you guys get here? Um, well, we started uh, IIX a few years ago. Um, and um, in addition to you know, building a company, we, we put together a great team. So we're very fortunate enough to uh, get some folks together that um, you know, really had some tenure in this space um, to, to, to come on board with IAX and, and take it forward um, to the milestones that it needed to achieve to, to complete the, the, the recent round, for example, that we just announced. So how long ago um, did you guys start seeing movement? Okay, you come together, a couple of years ago you mentioned. Uh, how long ago did you guys start? So IAX was first founded in 2011. Okay, so recently, um, yeah pretty much been in stealth mode for some time. Uh, we initially founded the company out of Canada, um, and then a little over a year ago, moved out here to the Bay Area. Um, and, and at that time, we started to do our next phase of hiring, uh, and, and really brought on board some key folks. In parallel with that, um, started to bring on board some very uh, respectful uh, what was the flashpoint of the of the you know kind of as the plan comes together early on? I mean, you know, being in stealth is fun, but also you know you don't not seeing the validation, but you got to look for your own internal validation with your team and the market. You guys are domain experts. But what's that flashpoint? What happened? Was it a key hire? Was it a key dinner, geek session? What was the, yeah, the one moment signing of a big customer contract? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. I'm like, okay, yeah, someone buy it <laughs> now. Now build it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Oops. <laughs> Sell, design, build. That's the that's the ethos of startups. But that no, but that's always the case, right? It's always like you know you're testing the market. No, that that was that was huge for us. That was uh, it was really exciting to to um, really put pen to paper, for lack of a better way to put it, and 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 not just do it once, um, but do it a few times over, and and in a relatively short period of time. And I, you know, I credit that to the team that we were able to put together, um, really to accomplish uh, some great milestones in a short period of time to really demonstrate the opportunity we have as a company. You know, before we get in, I mean, I love to geek out on entrepreneurship because given that you're fresh uh, financing, you still got the memories of when it was really, really tough in terms of the, all the hard work. I just shared an article this morning on my Silicon Valley network about, from Harvard Business Review, how VC funding can be bad for your startup. And really the premise of the article was not so much about VC funding, VC, ba VC bashing. It's really a lot of startups take up money too soon. And, and I think what you guys have shown in, in, in respect to what you've done as an entrepreneur is, You've, you've done the hard stuff first. You nail down a team, you identify an opportunity, you get some customer validation, you're capital efficient, you create that crossover moment, and then the VC funding is just a result of the success, not so much a PR moment in the sense. So in a way, you're kind of doing it right. Yeah. Um, take yeah. us through that journey. Was it hard? Was it, it, was, um, it was, it was definitely not easy, you know, to, to simply say, hey, look, we got a, an idea, and then go sell that idea. We're really not having a business. Um, and you have all the time in the world in that scenario to, to meet with people, meet with VCs. You know, that's not the approach that we necessarily took. Um, we start, first started off um, by uh, you know, seeding the company and, and, and really took a milestone-braced uh, approach. We self-defined milestones that we felt were important um, and to bring in initially some angel capital um, and then ultimately get, get the company to a point where um, we felt we, it was a more appropriate time for us um, to, to consider doing a Series A. And um, it, was, it, was a, it was an exciting process and, and uh, uh, we made it through it. So, and, and, now and as you, they say, the hard work uh, But you could, have taken, now. you could have taken more money. We could have, Again, yeah. So you really guys were sensitive to the fact that, hey, let's stay humble, let's stay hungry, 
and not yeah. get too fat. It's just well, you know, <laughs> we we also wanted to do right by existing stockholders and bring in that right amount of capital um, to help us um, uh, now take a step forward to the next milestone. Yeah, that we create set value. Company. Yeah. Create value and they step up and increase the value and not take too much dilution, but it sounds like the VC's got their pound of flesh, as they always say, uh, which is good for their, their thesis. Let's translate that now to the marketplace. You get Pier 2.0 kind of happening. What this is, is it's like a grassroots uh, event of folks who have been in the industry, the gray hairs, if you will, to experienced practitioners to the new blood coming in. So a bunch of young guns here, students, you know, not students, but like, you know, PhD masters kind of mm -hmm. level of people. Uh, it's attracting a talent base. So what is Peer 2.0? What is this community about? Why is this inaugural event so important? Um, well, first off, uh, you know, Peer 2.0 has is, um, been brought forward by the Peer 2.0 Foundation. It's a new foundation uh, that, that uh, has been formed and uh, this being the inaugural event, the, the whole theme is on education, specific to uh, uh, things like peering and interconnection. Um, very fortunate that in a relatively short period of time, we got a great, great roster of speakers, um, content providers, network operators, and, and what have you, uh, to really recognize the need for, for knowledge sharing uh, for that next generation to um, help uh, increase that understanding um, the other great thing is that you know, I think there was oh, oh, well over a third of, of students that registered. Um, so not just existing folks in, in, in business, let's say, whether, whether they're uh, employed by a network operator or, uh, or some other business, but, uh, but, but students with really high, high registration folks from Berkeley and, and, and so on and so forth. So that, that was really awesome because that really demonstrated that right mix that, that uh, really the foundation was after. In, in, in its event and, and ideally more events to come. It's, it's interesting with the students and the younger folks because we've had a few people on and I know some of the talks earlier today were about kind of the history of, of the internet and IP protocols and how we've got to where we are today. But but the, the, the newbies, the young kids, right, never had to experience that. They probably don't have any appreciation for that. They really probably don't have much time for that and really just want everything to work now on their mobile phone. Right. So I think it's a, it's a really interesting mix and probably a much heavier, sounds like student interest in this event than most of the events that we cover, but clearly their expectations from a consumer uh, of these services point of view is critical to actually being able to deliver those things. Yeah, it, you know, it's interesting. I mean, they talk, a lot of talk of the cloud, and in, in many ways we're probably living in the clouds, right? <laughs> um, but, you know, Jay Allison today, for example, did a nice uh, trip through memory lane on, on really how there's a lot of physical aspects to, to, to uh, how this works um, and, and that really bring us to have a cloud or clouds. Um, and so it's, um, that really opens your eyes. Uh, you know, it puts things in perspective when you see how interconnection happened and, and, and how it's happening uh, today. And um, I think a lot of um, up and comers, let's say, um, haven't had that perspective, maybe not necessarily been given uh, that experience or knowledge while, while going through, say, college, for example. And how receptive are they, or do they really care? I just wanted to act like Facebook or Amazon or, or my Google apps. Let's, let's you, make it happen. Well, I think, I mean, for those that attended here, I mean, uh, definitely a number of folks that, uh, again, not, not necessarily exclusively the younger generation, but there was definitely some conversations that I had with some, some younger folks and that were really appreciated appreciative of, of, um, uh, of some of the talks, for example, that, that took place yesterday afternoon. Um, even myself, I, you know, I, I just found it really cool to hear perspective from, from guys from Pandora, LinkedIn, GoDaddy, among others. I mean, just, just information, for example, that I myself even uh, hadn't, hadn't uh, been, been privileged to, to hear before. So, um, you know, to, 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 I could just imagine how some of the you know, younger folks were finding it just as interesting. So to talk about the, um, the dynamic between freedom, the democratization of the networks, meeting the business realities. I mean, you know, for profit, I mean, obviously you guys are not raising $10 million to be in the philanthropy business, either as NEA, they're looking for exits, right? So, mm -hmm. so there's, a, there's a pressure, but it's also a market growth opportunity. So you're also balancing this, this, this new model of 
hey, open source, cloud, building on, on, on stuff that's good, and net neutrality hanging over everyone's head, right? How do people build better networks, more choice, more freedom, at the same time make money? Mm -hmm. So how do you look at that as an entrepreneur? You got you to balance that. Well, you know, one of the interesting things is that if we could, you know, look back at the 90s, it was a much smaller market, a lot less market participants. Um, so one thing that's absolutely clear is, you know, this thing called the internet has gotten extremely huge. And in many respects, it's only the beginning. Uh, movement to the cloud now by the enterprise, um, this so-called internet of things era that we're, 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 we're uh, heading towards. So uh, from a business opportunity perspective, I think there's no, no shortage. Um, topics like net neutrality, I mean, been around uh, for a while. I don't think they're necessarily going to go away anytime soon. Um, the, particularly the U.S. economy has is, is survived many things and, and um, you know, I, I think we'll work, we'll work through it. Markets forces will work through whatever dynamics may shift, but nonetheless, the, the growth ahead of us is so huge. Uh, from bandwidth increases and so forth. I mean, it, it um, uh, is not something from our perspective as a, as a company we're necessarily concerned with, concerned about. So you see pretty good prospects out there when you do your pro formers. Your target audience is going to be enterprises. Are they going to be? I think you know, service providers. Yeah. So so uh, uh, among others, yes, definitely it includes the enterprise. I think now uh, topics of interconnection, for example. Um, will more and more continue to include the enterprise, where I think, let's call generate from one internet, uh, it was less enterprise, um, more like ISPs and, and content providers. So, so definitely um, we have a big focus on the enterprise. I'm really, really excited about that. It's interesting, you know, everyone talks about the world is flat, the flattening of networks. However you want to look at it, there's always this, this this abstraction layer that creates, uh, abstracts away complexity, and you're seeing this fabric of dynamic, policy-based, QoS, SLA-driven, workload-specific, all these buzzwords are pushing down to the network layer where they've got to be adaptive. Adaptive networking and it's just being available to be programmed. Mm -hmm. DevOps is really the, the shining trend that we see. That's really the, the poster child for the future. The DevOps revolution has been saying, hey, I'm a developer, I'm not a network guy, but I want to program the network as infrastructure as code. Explain that trend to the folks out there who aren't up on the speeds of DevOps. And what does that mean for the networks? What needs to get done and where is the, the, the sea change happening? Well, I think first and foremost, you know, we're, we're definitely, um, I think in many, many early stage companies, um, call them uh, software plays, content plays, what have you. I think the, the focus on network was always secondary. It was more on their applications and software that they were creating. Um, it's going to become more and more important, I think, lock step where, the, uh, where network will equally be important. And, and as a result of that, put more pressures on the network um, in, in virtualization of network, things of that sort, um, to be able to, or to allow the turn up of even internal services within an organization to really now move at the speed of business. And, and when, you, when you start to talk like that or think like that, you now need um, simpler solutions. And so this is where software and network, there's that convergence that's absolutely needed um, to really introduce that simplicity for, for, for organizations such as the enterprise. So Al, uh, for the people that weren't here, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about the talk that you just had uh, here at the event. I guess first of all, will the talks, do you know if they're going to make this stuff available? We make, uh, CUBE interviews are always available, but do you know if people will be able to come back after the fact and see the presentation? Uh, I, I believe so. I, you know, I, I um, won't put you on the spot. Yeah, but I'm, just I'm, curious, not, I'm just actually curious. not totally sure. It, so it might so be a send case. in a request to yeah. the Peer.O Foundation, tell them you'd like the stuff. But let's talk about your, your uh, your talk, you know, we talk a lot about Moore's Law and, and, and Moore's Law really being applied now kind of across the stack and we're getting this kind of perfect storm of all these great things really gearing up in terms of capacity and ability to deliver and, and vast amount of resources at our hand. You talked a little bit about Metcalf's Law in networking. I wonder if you could kind of expand on that a little bit and really what was sure. know, kind of the focus of your uh, presentation. Sure, sure. Well, I mean, we've obviously heard the term network effect and, and Metcalf's Law basically uh, surmises it into a formula. And uh, that network effect, in, for example, social media, be it the Facebooks, LinkedIn's of the world, you know, all was measured on size of their ecosystem. And ultimately, the market attributes a value to that. Well, similarly, you know, networks, obviously, 
uh, I guess it made sense that network effect, uh, in essence, uh, attribute a value to, to a network. And, and ultimately, uh, the talk wasn't necessarily specific to any one organization, but to uh, provide a different perspective on that network effect is not necessarily a generic, uh, it can't necessarily be a thought of the same uh, in all types of networks, types of network uh, services and, and so forth. So it was really meant to demonstrate that um, if you move a couple things around, how Metcalf's Law can ultimately um, uh, translate differently, um, produce you know, a different value that's exponentially different it was really the to, to, to the, the, the thrust of the the um, the talk I gave was so to just. What are some of those levers that really amplify the effect? Well, um, you know, interconnections evolving. We, you know, we have things like cloud exchange uh, now, and you know, in the early days there was internet exchanges, and they still very much exist still today as well. Um, in many cases, they were thought of, uh, or thought of to even still to this day in a, in a localized basis. And there's various local exchanges, be it internet, cloud, or what have you, that exist. And all things being equal, the 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 the, the purpose of it was to just introduce that dynamic. Again, putting technological analysis aside uh, and opinions on that for a moment. Um, how uh, 20 here and 20 there of let's say um, of of unique uh, networks, let's say um, when you apply Metcalf law in, in, in looking at them as separate and distinct versus as if they were unified, the network value is not uh, necessarily one plus one equals two. It, it's, it's exponentially different when, when you apply that, that formula. And, and, and so it, it's value, not necessarily for, um, from a finance perspective, but for your customers, your, your, you know, the, the potential users of, of a particular service or application. And so that was really the, the, uh, the, the, the thrust of it, to really give people perspective that don't necessarily take things at face value. Okay. Um, how you do things can really impact your business, um, your service, or what have you, to create a much more dynamic value ultimately for whoever you're targeting. And it would it would seem then that the fact that we have kind of an API economy, the fact that a, a large number of both consumer as well as enterprise applications are moving into a cloud infrastructure, so they're no longer in that isolated uh, sub-network, if you will, that clearly there's business value being released all across the network, both for the applications as well as the network providers as well as the the consumers of those services. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. I agree with that. So talk about what's next for you guys. Obviously, um, you got some build out to do. Uh, you guys are big uh, players in the Peer 2.0, and you know, you know it's not your conference. You're part of the uh, sponsors here. You're part of the community, um, which is great, because it's great for recruiting, great for evangelism, but it's also good for the openness of the web, right? Mm -hmm. And the internet, so, so great there. But on the business front, what is your key build out mode right now? Hiring, customer acquisition, What's the big to-do yes. list? <laughs> yes and yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it um, I, I, mean, I mean that actually in all seriousness. Um, you know, we're definitely focused um, equally on expansion, uh, business development activities, um, and, and expansion both from a geographical perspective um, in terms of rolling out our solution into more markets now, as well as expanding our organizational headcount. Uh, you know, bringing uh, on board more uh, more individuals onto our team. So it's it's um, you know we're firing on all cylinders to 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 take our company to the next phase. It's been great to get to know you. Had a great time last night having some beers at the uh, at the at the event uh, party last night. I've known Bill for years. Great great team you have. Congratulations on the success. Al, ten million dollars NEA funding, uh, fresh financing in the bank. Um, watch for IIX uh, in the marketplace again. A lot of stuff happening. Great market opportunity, congratulations. This is theCUBE, make sure I think the signal from the noise here live in Silicon Valley in Palo Alto at Pier 2.0. I'm John Furrier with Jeff Frick. We'll be right back after this short break. <laughs>